morning. Uh, my name is Hamid Mehran. I'm the moderator for the session entitled What Kind of Frameworks Needs to Be Needed, Adopted by Governments in Order to Promote Better Governance of Bank Holding Companies. Um, this is a very complex topic, and as you know, governance is a very fuzzy topic as well. Uh, hopefully, we will be able to answer some of these questions. Uh, there are five outstanding scholars on the panel, and uh, we will hear from them. But before I introduce the uh, members of the panel, I have a few comments. At uh, the outset, I should say that these comments are mine, rather than the Federal Reserve Bank of New York or Federal Reserve Systems. Um, the concept of conflict of interest and governance failure is not new in the U.S. business history, particularly in the financial services industry. Uh, after each crisis, we have had observers evaluated what happened, and typically they conclude that governance was a serious problem and it was at the heart of every financial crisis. And typically laws are adopted, and uh, then, as Susan indicated, there are other governance crises appears and failures. Now, moving to academic environment, where I spent uh, many of my years there, mm -hmm. academics have studied governance at least for the past four decades. There is a large <coughs> volume of work there, but it is fair to conclude that at the end of evaluating the message from all these studies, there are more questions than answers. Now, part of the problem using academic work relating to financial services industry is that most academics have hardly even touched financial services industry, and bulk of the research has been on industrial firms. Looking at the regulation in the banking industry, in fact, many of the arguments that academics have proposed, such as increased outside directors, size of the board, or board meetings, nominating committee, having uh, an outsider to be the head of the compensation committee, uh, so on and so forth, these are the things which actually banking industry practices extensively. We had the law passed in the early 1990s, FDIC Act. And in fact, if one reads the law and rules and regulations very carefully, it is even more stringent in terms of practice and requirement than Sovereign Oxley, except CEO certification and CFO certification of financial statements. So we even in the banking industry have laws which seems to protect many people and the public, but again, banking sector can be in crisis as we observe. So I think one thing that we need to do is to move out of the box or the framework that we have been working in the past. <coughs> I think, in my view, one of the ways that in any kind of crisis we approach and, and try to solve the problem is by adopting some rules most of the times without the insight from academics. So I think there is one model that let's adopt the rule that we think is best and let's academic figure out the economics of it later and make the law more careful. Another approach is basically to let all the ideas come to the surface and lets the best idea wins. And I think in this kind of a crisis we are in, we all have a stake in this. And somehow we need to reconcile the approaches we have had in the past. I'm not saying that this is not something we are not doing now, 
but I'm saying whatever we do, we need to do better to bring all the participants on the table and get the best ideas to solve government crisis that we are facing. Now, I really admire the fact that the two leading institutions decided to sponsor this conference, and hopefully we hear from the panel, my panel and other panels, a way of thinking about governance that we have not thought before. I think we need fresh ideas rather than raise the number of outside directors and things of that nature. We really need to think about these issues differently. We really need to understand what governance is. And at the end of it, we have to recognize that regulators are actually an arm in governance of every financial institutions. What should regulators, what role regulators should play, it's really important in this uh, dimension, and we really need to discuss this. Now, let me introduce the member of my panels, uh, Charlie Calamaris, uh, Henry Kaufman Professor of Financial Institution at Columbia, Tano Santos, Franklin Pitcher Johnson, Professor of Finance and Economics, Columbia University, Harold Haw, Professor of Finance at INSEAD, and Otavio Damaso, uh, Head of Department, Financial System Regulation and Organization, Bank of uh, Brazil, and Stefan Jacobson, a Senior Economist, Regulatory Policy Division, OECD. So we will start with uh, Charlie, uh, and uh, you know the uh, timeline, and it's pretty tight. Thank you. I have an hour then or something. <laughs> yes, you have it. Such a small topic. Okay, great. Thank you. Thanks, Sandra. Well, good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, Bruce said that I would uh, be saying that, that everyone's wrong uh, today. Uh, no, Bruce, you're wrong. Uh, <laughs> Actually, I'm going to be saying that, uh, first of all, that everyone's right. Or at least I'm going to go ahead and assume that everyone's right. Because in my view, actually, uh, that's what's necessary to assume to make some sense out of what we just experienced. So let me explain what I mean. Susan talked about Fannie and Freddie, which are some of my favorite topics to talk about. Uh, she also mentioned the leverage problems. I think that we have some pretty obvious lessons that have nothing to do with um, uh, sort of private sector compensation or private sector corporate governance coming out of this. Fannie and Freddie ended up with half of the subprime uh, risk in their portfolios. Um, I've read the emails between the risk managers of Fannie and Freddie and their CEOs, which was part of my congressional testimony. I can tell you the risk managers in 2004 said they did not want to do no docs lending, which Fannie and Freddie went into very aggressively. They got back a message saying we have a political mandate to do it. We have to do it. it has nothing to do with private markets, it has everything to do with political mandates that forced from 2004 to 2006 the 800 pound gorillas in the room to tell everyone forget about representations and warranties in their portfolios that you're constructing, forget about no docs uh, problems, go ahead. And the risk manager who stood his ground was fired and now teaches uh, elementary school mathematics in Prince George's County, Maryland. That's not a market problem, obviously. That's a political problem. It's also off limits to Washington to fix. Not even are they willing to, in this current debate, adopt the 5% down payment limit. So we have a Looney Tunes mortgage system. I could spend the rest of the time explaining the politics of why that's so hard to change. Of course, it's not just that po political problem isn't just in the US. Look at the Germany, the Landesbanken. Again, has nothing to do with private market corporate governance. Those are government-run institutions who are driven by, again, political incentives. And of course, it's not just the Landesbanken. Tano is going to have to explain to us the Cajas and what they are, are up to, similar sort of problem. Of course, the European government, governments don't like talking about how much they've contributed to this problem through things that have nothing to do with corporate governance problems, have everything to do with political will 
And then, of course, the Basel Committee, <coughs> uh, their approach to measuring risk, which academics have been criticizing for two decades, is also politically off limits to really change, it seems. Maybe we'll see a change. I doubt it. Because it's part of a political equilibrium of risk measurement denial and capital budgeting denial that has given us uh, extreme fragility in banking and we're, I, I don't think we're going to be able to get rid of it. Certainly none of the legislation. You won't see the criticism of the Basel Committee anywhere in the, either the Senate or the House legislation. Uh, now let's turn to the, the remaining issues. I, what about corporate governance and what about pay? Well, yes, I actually believe that there's, there's an issue there. Once you put aside all that I've just said, which maybe is 90% of what we should be talking about in this crisis, there's still this additional 10%. What is it? How come Citibank, UBS, and Merrill Lynch continue to act on the buy side very aggressively, th um, much more than, let's say, Deutsche Bank, JP Morgan, Bank of America, Credit Suisse, HSBC? I could go down a long list. In other words, this wasn't a crisis of the private sector failure. It was a crisis in which some institutions in the private sector decided to take on huge risks that were unwise, while others didn't. Goldman Sachs didn't. I left them off the list. Actually, the, the number of private institutions that didn't make this mistake is much larger of the large global institutions. is much larger number than the ones who did. I would say if you add AIG, Lehman, uh, Bear Stearns, UBS, Citi, and Merrill, you're sort of done with your list. And that's what's interesting, I think, about the main topic we're having discussion about today, but I want to emphasize, let's get real here, the problem of regulatory reform is, first of all, the political constraints that are pushing us to have this discussion about corporate pay, because the politicians like this topic, because this allows them to get votes by beating up on the bankers, getting people like Joe Stiglitz, my, our colleague, who loves to do that, who feeds that, that political need by so many of those political leaders. And that's what we're here to talk about. It's interesting also to ask, why are we talking about this topic? I think it's a good topic. I agree with it. But I wanted to start by pointing out all the topics we're not talking about. Then when we get into this topic, the question is going to be, when you're trying to understand why Citibank, Merrill Lynch, and UBS did what they did, was it because of pay or was it because of bad corporate governance more generally? If you were going to ask what institutions had been involved in the worst scandals in terms of criminal or unethical activity over the past decade, those three names would have come up repeatedly. Is that related to having poor risk management? And is that related to taking excessive risks? Yes. So how do you disentangle? We're going to hear, see a lot of regression analysis, which may be right, but may be wrong. Because how do we disentangle? the pay component from the broader corporate governance component, which pay is epiphenomenal to. I'd like to see someone explain how they're going to do that. And that's really going to be the thrust of my comments, that what we really need is a robust regulatory intervention, one that starts not by saying, as Bruce said, that I'd say everyone's wrong, but by starting by saying, well, everyone's right. I don't know whether it's corporate governance or pay, and I don't think you do either. For, to explain UBS and City and Merrill, and I certainly know that is only about 10% of the problem we just experienced, wh whichever it is. So I want to figure out uh, not this academic question of how to publish another referee journal article, which we're all going to be doing, but how to actually get something useful to happen in the political sphere in a robust way, assuming that we can all agree that these are reasonable points of view. Can we come up with a robust set of uh, ideas that are going to deal with this no matter what weights we attach to these different stories? And my answer is yes. But the political challenge is, even though we can, the problem is the politicians won't like that answer. They want us to talk about pay because that's what gets them votes. They don't want to hear about all these other complicated things. Five minutes, good. So uh, here's what I think the right way to approach this, this issue is. First, I think firms should be uh, in the business of value maximization. That should be their objectives. What about other stakeholders uh, relating to, let's say, the FDIC or bank borrowers or the economy more generally because of excess risk-taking? I think that the basic framework we have is right, which is 
regulation should place constraints on firms in the interest of those constituencies, in the interest of those stakeholders, but that we should encourage management at large bank holding companies to focus on value maximization of the firm subject to those constraints. That is a very important distinction. It probably is going to separate me from some of the people in the room here later today. I think regulation should force banks not to take on excessive risks from the public standpoint. Corporate governance should force banks not to take on excessive risks from the shareholder's standpoint. Those are very big distinctions, and I could spend the rest of my meager time talking about them. So I think that is, uh, that's my philosophy. The problem uh, is that it isn't just an issue, once we even focus on the, the issue of uh, value maximization, it isn't just that we have broader constituencies that regulation has to protect, but we have a narrow constituency that wasn't protected. The banks, those three banks I mentioned, sold out their stockholders during this whole boom. And why did they do it? Could it have been pay? Yes, probably, but uh, I think it, it probably was in part, as we'll talk about. But I think that there were other issues here. And the question is, how do we strengthen bank corporate governance more generally? Notice that you're not going to get takeovers of financial institutions the way you're going to get takeovers of manufacturing companies because they have human capital, and as soon as there's a hostile takeover, the human capital goes elsewhere. You, you've, you can't tell me there's only been, I think, one attempt at a hostile takeover in the financial services industry that I'm even aware of. They don't happen. So we don't have corporate governance through that mechanism. And then we have all these regulatory restrictions that limit the suitability of who can own controlling <laughs> interests in banks. So what we've done is basically make it very hard for anyone with a brain to control large uh, banks. We've done that by regulation. And so part of our solution, I would suggest to you, is that we start rethinking all these things that the lawyers did for us in the 1930s. Yes, it was, the, it was the legal theories of the 1930s, buttressed again in the 1950s by the Bank Holding Company Act, that limited concentration of ownership in banks and limited who could be an owner in banks. And on top of that, we have the natural problem that you can't have hostile takeovers. Baggett and Bolton, not this Bolton, but a different one, have a paper uh, which I recommend to all of you, which I like, which says basically um, ownership structure is extremely important for effective corporate governance. Duh. And we have an entire regulatory apparatus designed to make that not happen, to make concentration of ownership by intelligent people not happen. N not part of the discussion in Washington. Okay, so I want to talk all about things we could do in my last two minutes. Um, one of them, of course, is to do something about reducing those barriers. Um, but I also want to add another idea. Uh, you'll see that at the bottom of my list, I actually am very open to the idea of um, doing something about extending the, uh, the time horizon of equity-based pay. Notice, of course, that's not costless. You're going to have to pay more because now the pay isn't as good, so you're going to have to pay a lot more. But uh, I think it's worth it. Um, but that's only part of the solution. And I want to emphasize, especially since I know Lucian's going to talk about it later, that I very strongly support, as I think most academics working in this topic do, the requirement of a new contingent capital uh, as part of an equity requirement in the banking system. Why? Because what it does is it creates a constituency outside the bank because we're not going to fix this political problem of corporate governance in the banks because politically it's off limits. It's a good idea, won't happen. Pay is too uh, small uh, a, a tool to use to fix it. What we need to do is we need to create an external constituency of debt holders who will care about, penalize, keep track of and penalize excessive risk taking. That was Mark Flannery's basic idea and many of us had this same basic idea with mandatory subordinated debt requirements. I don't have time to explain all of the details of this, but I would say the main thing, if you want to prevent excessive risk taking, you have to create a constituency that loses from risk. And the great thing about uh, debt is that that's the constituency, uninsured <laughs> debt. It doesn't benefit from a mean-preserving expansion in risk. Uh, 
that's the e essence of uh, the idea of trying to bolster bank risk-taking performance by creating a new constituency outside the bank of uninsured, credibly uninsured debt holders. We could spend a lot of time talking about how to do that, but that's the essential idea. So my bottom line here is, um, sure, let's talk about pay, let's fix pay, but let's also get serious. Uh, this is a small, first of all, the corporate governance problem more generally was a small part of this crisis. It's also a much broader problem than, corporate, than pay. And uh, we need to think about fixes in a very challenging environment where the politics doesn't want to hear about uh, the need to reform our corporate governance system. And that's why I think uh, contingent capital certificates are a very attractive idea because they're politically feasible, I believe, and uh, in ways that other reforms aren't, and they attack the problem directly. Thanks. Thank you, Charlie. The next speaker is Tano. Uh, we'll take questions at the end uh, of all the talks. This is Santos, I think. Santos. So thank you very much. Um, thank you very much. This is uh, a wonderful uh, conference, and thank you very much for inviting me to present uh, my ideas. I'm the sole, I think I believe I'm the sole Spaniard in the room, and given that Spain is going to bring down Western civilization, I thought that it would be <laughs> useful to make some comments, and my experience on how to think about this issue has been quite colored by the Spanish experience during the last two years. And I want to make some points about this, more, some more general than others, and of course I will address the problem of the cajas that have been so much in the news of late at, uh, in the last uh, three minutes or four minutes of, um, okay? Um, Oops. So let me just say very briefly that uh, you know, the reason why we care about bank governance is because we believe these banks have a peculiar role in, in, in the economy and that we believe there's a systemic implication of bank governance in the banks. But one of the things that, at least to me, and the story, by the way, let me tell you from the very beginning that the story of Spain is yet to be finished. As you know well, we have an ongoing <coughs> crisis. Uh, you know, we have a, a dual crisis of sovereign and the financial system. But uh, the story is yet to be, we haven't seen the final chapter yet, so everything is up, uh, has up in the air as we, as, we, as, we, as we speak. But one of the things that I want to uh, convey to you is that you can have a wonderful governance system. The Spanish banks actually did very well in this crisis. There's yet to be one euro of, pu of uh, public monies to, be, uh, to recapitalize the Spanish banks. Santander, BBVA, Popular, Bank Inter, Banesto, they seem to be doing relatively, uh, they're relatively uh, well. Again, the story is yet to be told, but so far that hasn't happened. Now the cajas are a completely different story, and I will come back to the end, uh, to this issue at the end. But we had a phenomenal real estate bubble in Spain. The banks were very good at issuing a phenomenal amount of mortgages, of generating a phenomenal amount of risks, even though they were very well run. We don't care about governance per se. We care about the state of the economy. We care about a stable economic environment. So we need to think about governance also in a broader context, not just to guarantee the stability of the banking system, but also to guarantee the stability of the economy and realize that sometimes you can have very good banks and a very bad economy that is very bad precisely because the banks are being very good at doing what they do. So uh, that's the first point that I wanted to make. One of the points that came in our, uh, you know, that the speaker made at the, at the, at the very beginning, uh, Ms. Pai, at the very beginning, was this issue of governance and risk management. These two things uh, get, uh, you know, uh, how would I put it? They always go hand in hand when talking about banks, okay? Whether it's an issue of good governance or risk management, okay? And, you know, we have to understand, or at least in my opinion, that boards are essentially the first principle in a pyramid of principal agent problems inside financial organizations, okay? And that leverage makes uh, banks incredibly sensitive to governance <coughs> mistakes. So if you have actually bad design or governance institutions, or some misaligned incentives, well, leverage makes the problems 10 times worse. And it's, uh, it's just the nature of the beast. It's not the same thing to have a bad governance issue in a textile company than to have it in a bank. And it has to do with the issue of, of leverage, that they're incredibly sensitive because of the, very, uh, the nature of the liabilities to any type of uh, shock to the system, okay? I want to add to this thing that I, I just cannot think of governance statically. I think one of the most important things is the issue of financial innovations, and that they change the nature of principal and problems. We went through in the late 80s and early 90s through all these derivatives uh, uh, problems, okay? And the reason was that, well, derivatives changed dramatically the landscape because it allowed people in the organization, people who were relatively low in the organization, to take a phenomenal amount of risk 
with very little capital. That's essentially what a derivative security is. Okay, it's basically a very levered position on some risk. Okay. And this is actually something very difficult to control. It took a long time for the financial service industry to actually to come with the technological means to actually do the continuous monitoring that this problem required. Finally, I would like to add on this point that knowledge at the top, the board, and at the bottom is of the essence. Okay, one of the things that is uh, striking is that these things are awfully complicated. And, you know, just by the nature of how we promote people inside organizations, well, it's only natural that the knowledge of the people who sit at boards and who have the, uh, the principles, so to speak, is going to be out of whack with the knowledge at the bottom of the organization. And these are the guys who have contacts with the markets, who take risks, who actually can generate problems for the organization. And, I, I, you know, this is, this is a, a, a pervasive problem, in my opinion, about uh, financial organizations. And it's not a problem of governance, okay? I want to echo something that uh, I believe Amit was saying at the very beginning, which is uh, governance and the role of the supervisor. One of the striking things about the Spanish experience, when you talk with the, the big Spanish banks, uh, you know, you talk with the people in Santander and with the people of BBVA, is that essentially, as far as I can tell, they have a symbiotic relation with the Bank of Spain. So Banco Santander is very proud to tell you that when you go to their city outside Madrid, and you know, they, they have this phenomenal facility where they have all their employees, uh, you know, they have uh, uh, several parking spots that say Bank of Spain because the supervisors are there on a daily basis sitting with every single of their big uh, uh, risk management units. And I think this actually is something that we need to devote some time uh, to think about, you know. There's a certain degree of obsolescence in, uh, when it comes to corporate governance. Corporate governance depreciates on account of financial innovations. And this is where the role of the uh, discretionary supervisors can be very useful. Now, I don't, you know, you, uh, I don't know how to think about this, but essentially at some point we have to live with the supervisors that we have. You know, we have to, there, there has to be an implicit trust. I don't know how to actually think about incentives for the supervisor, but essentially, uh, you know, we have to live with their ability to actually monitor problems in real time. Let me tell you an example of this that I was told by the head of, um, of uh, banking supervision in the Bank of Spain. It was the issue of, of balance sheet transactions in, uh, in, uh, in the, in in the Spanish banks, you know, at some point they came with the wonderful idea of, well, look at our American competitors. They're, want, they're having a wonderful time generating all the risk of balance sheet. Would you, you know, wouldn't we nice if we did the same thing, okay? They went to the Bank of Spain and the Bank of Spain apparently sat down with them. I don't know how this happened formally and I'm looking, I'm seeing them again in a couple of weeks. I'm gonna ask them about the story again. They went over it and they said, we just don't get it. We just don't get what is the difference between on and off balance sheet from a risk uh, uh, capital point of view. Now, it's perfectly legal. There's nothing in Spanish law that prevented these banks from actually entering into these uh, off-balance sheet transactions. They, they were just told not to do it by the Bank of Spain. Now, I believe this is a very tenuous uh, issue. I mean, who is the Bank of Spain to tell a private bank how to run their business? Okay, now it's a decision that proved wise with the benefit of insight, okay? But, you know, we, we have to understand how this prudential supervision in real time works. You know, when you have these issues of governance, of financial innovations, of changing in the uh, competitive environment, that may force banks to do certain things that otherwise they wouldn't do. I want to echo as well something that our initial speaker said. It's, 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 it's something, that, you know, whether competition in the banking system pushes you to do certain things that otherwise you wouldn't do. Either because there's some type of short-termism in the stock market that forces you know, banks to generate uh, you know, a lot of earnings in the short run that may take you, they may lead you to take excessive risk and so on and so forth. This is another of the things that at least when you talk with uh, people in the banking industry, in the Spanish banking industry, tell, they tell you right away that the Bank of Spain is actually a wonderful um, uh, commitment device not to do certain crazy things. Because, you know, you know that if uh, Bank of Spain is telling you not to do X, then they're also telling BBA not to do Y. Okay, you know this, and that allows you to actually, you know that you're not gonna be competing in some for dimension, okay? Now, again, I think this story is a little bit more murky. I try, you, you know, I don't understand how this actually works, but it's something worth thinking about. You know, the, 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 uh, our initial speaker was saying, well, we need the, uh, the, uh, the treasury to tell us that we cannot issue um, no documentation loans. Well, you can do that yourself. You know, you can say, I'm not gonna issue a loan that is not fully documented, you know, with this type of requirements and so on and so forth. Why do we need the regulator to tell us this? What is the failure uh, in a competitive setup that actually, uh, you know, may force a good institution that knows that I shouldn't be doing this to actually do it? Okay, so we need to understand that as well. 
I want to finish with some comments about uh, the cajas, because the cajas are actually, and yet, by the way, this, uh, the, the story where, you know, this story has 10 chapters and we're in chapter five. And again, you know, they may indeed bring down Western civilization, but, uh, you know, the, the jury's still out, okay? The cajas, which are the equivalent of the savings and loans, you know, is where the problem in the financial system is in Spain, okay? Now, they have a very similar type of structure. They are FDI insured, uh, the, the equivalent of the FDIC in Spain, okay? But they have an implicit guarantee by local governments, okay? They've had some problems in attracting good management, and I will give you some evidence about this, okay? And it is true that there's some weak evidence that they were always the lead in particularly bad syndicated loans, but it's not overwhelming evidence, okay? Now, one of the striking things about these cajas is that profit maximization, and echoing something that Charlie was just saying one minute ago, is not an objective. The cajas have objectives that have to do with the, whatever the foundation does, you know, as they all, just, let me just explain briefly, uh, the way a caja works is that it's owned by a foundation, to which uh, you know, the majority of the dividends accrue, essentially. And then this foundation does social work with it. They have a long history in Europe. You know, if you ever go to Madrid, I very much recommend you to go to the building in Caja Madrid and see the beautiful uh, uh, facility that has been there since uh, the late uh, 1840s, I believe. Okay? And uh, you know, they were basically funded by you know, you know, noblemen who wanted to help the poor, by Catholic institutions, and so on and so forth. Now, just to give you an idea of how extreme this example is, as you know, Caja Sur was one of the savings and loans that was intervened by the Bank of Spain last weekend. It made the news. It's a relatively small caja, and it's uh, owned essentially by the Catholic Church. In fact, the CEO uh, is a priest. The last CEOs were priests, okay? Their degrees were all in theology. As a Catholic, you know, I'm a little bit distressed that theology is not good enough to run a bank. But, uh, you know, but, you know, it tells you a little bit, you know, what these, you know, what these, uh, what these cajas were about. And they were doing a lot of good work in Córdoba, Caja Sur, okay? The work that, you know, if you are socially minded, we would all agree, it's a good thing, okay? But they essentially, they have no market mechanism for discipline. It's no wonder they did a lot of, you know, the problems are there. They, they didn't have any market mechanism for discipline. They don't, you know, they're controlled by the, uh, at some degree, by the, uh, by the local government. So they, there's some problems. But... There's some new work, actually, that I very much recommend you guys, to, uh, you know, for those of you who are interested in this problem, by Vicente Cunyat uh, and Luis Garicano, both at LSE, uh, that made quite a splash in, in, in Spain when it came out, because essentially, the, it, it essentially says, well, hold on one second, it may not be this issue of political connections what is behind the cajas, okay? So, um, the basically, this paper essentially tells you, and, uh, you know, going back to what Charlie was saying at the end of his uh, presentation, uh, that neither formal governance institutions nor real ones correlate with portfolio composition or performance. Essentially, the fact that the board is dominated by the local political parties doesn't seem to have much of an effect on whether, statistically, whether these, uh, these, uh, these cajas were you know, overly investing in real estate or they were funding projects that otherwise shouldn't be funded. And in particular, if you look at the Basque cajas, and if you're acquainted with the intricacies of Spanish politics, the Basque Cajas are completely dominated by the local Basque political parties. They have the most, you know, it's a very incredibly political board. They are the better run. These Cajas are very, very efficiently and very professionally run, okay? It's the chairman, not the board. Uh, you know, in fact, you know, one of the things that you actually see is that whether the chairman was a pro previously political appointee, or whether the chairman does not have an MBA, I think I'm in the contract to say that, you know, actually this forecasts uh, your long composition and performance of the year, and performance of the year, of your overall portfolio, okay? And there are many such chairmen, for whatever reason, running these cajas, of which there's 45, as you know, there's a wave of consolidation taking place. But uh, it looks like these political connections are much more uh, subtle than it may look at first. And if you think about it, this is exactly the way it should be. Because think about, you know, this is one thing that we should think about. What is the objective of a caja? Well, it may be, think for a moment that it's just political patronage for a second. Well, the question then is, what is the effect of that in running the caja? And the answer is, under the null, you know, it may be a very good thing to actually maximize the net present value of the caja and then distribute uh, the proceeds via the foundation to your political friends, okay, to do political work. So it's not obvious, by the way, how performance is going to be linked to political contamination in the Cajas. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tano. Uh, Harold Toth.
thank you very much for inviting me. Thanks to the organizers. Um, after having heard about Spain, we can move to Germany now. Um, unlike Spain or the US, Germany didn't have a real estate bubble. So we are basically talking here about an international transmission of a financial crisis. Uh, and uh, you might have read the latest book by Michael Lewis. There are frequent references to German banks. They always talk about the stupid German Landesbanken uh, in this book. So this is sort of a more detailed studies on Dusseldorf. Um, we can also start with a other quote here to get right into the topic. Um, it is about a study about financial competence of boards. So uh, here's a quote uh, by uh, the FT journalist Wolfgang Müncher, who is passing as an expert on the German banking system. He noticed that relatively early on that most of the uh, losses related to uh, subprime uh, secura securities were actually concentrated in public banks. Hmm? And he asserted that this is not, a, not by chance, the reason being that uh, the uh, publicly controlled so-called Landesbanken were mostly uh, governed by boards, politically appointed boards that were financially literate. So what this study does and this paper, which is sort of published now in the Journal of Economic Policy, is basically verifying these two claims and looking at this in more detail beyond sort of journalistic assertions. Um, so very much the focus is a study of expertise is going in the direction of uh, what Susan said. What expertise did different, different banks have in Germany and how does it correlate with uh, actual losses. Okay, let me um, point out four different things I want to do. I want to look at uh, private versus state banks and show you something about, document some of the performance differences during the crisis. Um, I then uh, say a few words about uh, board incompetence and how we, or board competence, how we try to measure it. Uh, then, most importantly, the nexus between board competence and uh, crisis performance, and I might have some more time, say a few words on CEO pay and the crisis. Okay, a few words about, first of all, to introduce you to the structure of the uh, German banking uh, system. Uh, we looked at the basically uh, 29 biggest banks in this study, uh, which are composed of 13 state-owned uh, banks, so-called Landesbanken, and 19, uh, sorry, 16 private banks. Uh, the German banking sector is, in a way, a very interesting case study for these two reasons. First of all, there wasn't a local bubble, a uh, real estate bubble, so all of it is basically sort of a, a foreign transmission of, of um, uh, the financial crisis. Uh, secondly, there's very little international banking. And thirdly, we have this sort of nice split of the German banking sector and the state-controlled uh, banks, or state-owned banks, and private banks. And both actually turn out to have very different uh, corporate governance structure uh, and a long history of, of difference. Uh, so that makes it kind of an interesting uh, natural experiment to look at the role of board composition. Um, okay, I should say that uh, the Landesbanken are very different from the two state-owned, um, or partly state-owned, uh, mortgage lenders, uh, Freddie May and Freddie Mac, in the sense that they were actually pursuing what uh, Charles would say a, maxim a value maximization objective. Huh? So the very fact that they were state control is not saying that they were not pursuing the same objectives of, in terms of value maximization as the private banks did. And if I had more time, I could document this and, and try to explain this in more detail. Uh, however, given that they had a very different ownership structure, their board structure was very different. There were a lot of uh, civil servants and politicians on the board. Therefore, we have kind of the same uh, commercial objective, but uh, for exogenous reasons, a very different uh, uh, board structures. 
Um, in fact, if they had pursued a political mandate and landed primarily to local constituencies, the Landesbanken would have spared, would have been spared of the crisis. No? They certainly didn't have a mandate to uh, lend primarily to uh, Californian households or to invest in, in this risk. So anything in terms of uh, political mandate should bias the results towards lower, uh, lower losses for the uh, Landesbanken. So let me start off presenting the evidence. On the first assertion, Münchau is actually right. It turns out that if you look at the sample of the 30s largest bank uh, controlling for asset size, the state-owned banks in fact did have uh, substantially higher losses. And the difference here is economically very significant. It's statistically significant. We can roughly say that the underperformance of state banks uh, amounts to a 200% larger loss. So that is very, very important. Um, different ways of getting to this. The original evidence actually focused on the earlier period of the crisis, but we have now updated and the results are uh, robust to more recent uh, updated statistics on losses. Okay, so what is, the, what is sort of behind this uh, enormous underperformance of the Landesbanken and the uh, state-owned, majority state-owned companies? So here we looked in the second step now at uh, competence of boards by uh, studying, given that we had a relatively simple, small sample, we looked very in very much detail at the composition of the board and basically study the resumes and the uh, career path of uh, roughly 600 supervisory board members. So, and we looked at uh, basically uh, 14 different criteria, education measures, so a little bit like for the Texas, whether they had uh, higher education or not, business education. We looked at measures of financial expertise, bank expertise in particular, financial market expertise, or more recent financial expertise. Here we had six criteria. And finally, we looked at general management expertise. So grouped them into uh, three different subgroups. Uh, what we find here is, in fact, the public banks, meaning the state-owned banks here, had substantial difference in uh, what we call financial expertise, but also in the other two dimensions. But it was starkest in dimension of financial expertise. And the reason here is sort of partly explained by a lot of political representatives on the boards for the uh, public banks. So this is a very, very stark difference in financial competence of boards. Uh, if you look at this in much detail, you even find that union representatives, surprisingly, turned out to have more financial competence in uh, the private banks than they had in the public banks. So, so there are ob ob obviously some peer effects and so on, uh, but I don't want to spend more on this. So uh, on the second dimension, uh, Münchhaus was also right in his guess that uh, there is a very, very substantial difference in financial competence over these two subsectors of the uh, German banking sector. Uh, the state-owned banks had essentially <coughs> financially literate boards. Yeah. So then brings us then to the final uh, third step to see whether there's a connection, is there a nexus between board competence and performance? And the answer to this question is yes, particular in the dimension of financial competence. So the most important coefficient, if you run a simple regression here, for example, losses over assets on an index of financial competence of the board, you find a very, very strong impact. Uh, much stronger than, for example, education or general management competence, which sort of um, supports our prior that uh, board competence and particular financial board competence matters for crisis outcomes here, or at least are correlated. With respect to the causality, we went one step further uh, from simple correlation evidence and try to find instruments, what are good instruments, to uh, exclude the reverse causality. Obviously, if you had a risk-loving CEO, he might sort of uh, appoint uh, board members that are not very uh, competent to avoid any kind of control. Uh, but what you can say is that the CEO certainly didn't have control over how many state bureaucrats or civil servants or political appointees would be on his board. I mean, just uh, if you are the Landesbank of ba Bavaria, automatically by statute, the uh, 
finance minister of Bavaria or his state secretary would be on the board and so on. So we can actually find pretty nice instruments here to uh, exclude the causality running from the CEO for the management team to the board members by taking, making use of these institutional features that some of the dimension of uh, the board composition was beyond his control. And so the, the uh, IV regression more or less support the evidence that the causality is most likely r uh, runs from board composition to performance. Okay, executive pay. Uh, executive pay doesn't play a big role in Germany, so it's a minor issue, I guess, here. Um, but to the extent we look at it, we find a positive correlation in line with what Rene will, will um, say. So let me sum up uh, the evidence. Um, there's strong evidence for underperformance of uh, state banks. Uh, it was not in pursuit of any uh, public mandate, but these state banks were running sort of a value maximization objectives, but there are uh, board competence was very much lacking, and uh, we find evidence for a direct nexus between uh, board competence, uh, a particular financial literacy of the board, and the crisis performance. So in this sense, I think this is sort of uh, really important evidence to validate our focus on uh, government issues, government's issues. Okay, I think I s mentioned this. Um, Okay, political implications. I think uh, state ownership, therefore, uh, should, in light of the German experience, be seen very much as a as a um, liability to the extent it comes with worse corporate governance. Uh, and uh, better bank governance seems to be sort of a very legitimate focus on bank regulation. And uh, uh, with this remark, I'll finish here. Thank you. <laughs>